Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am glad to see so many of you returned from lunch, uh, and I hope, as you sit there digesting, uh, that you'll, you'll listen for a few moments to uh, a simple message. I have no equations uh, in my presentation today. Um, I have uh, three conclusions at the end, uh, and I'll take 15 minutes or so to tell you how I come to those conclusions. Uh, I hope it's a simple message that uh, we'll, we'll do for after lunch. So. Um, a brief overview of what I'm going to say over the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Channel Tunnel. Um, I'm going to talk about the incidents that happened in the, the Channel Tunnel, three of them. Uh, I'll then I'll talk in general terms about fire development in large tunnel fires. Um, and then I'll focus in, uh, tying in with this morning session on ventilation, uh, on the ventilation changes that happened during those incidents. And then I'll talk about fire growth and spread of what you might call the fire dynamics uh, during the two large incidents, that one, the one in 1996 and the one in 2008. And then, as I say, I have three uh, conclusions and recommendations at the end. I, I had hoped when uh, I put in the abstract to do this presentation that the uh, official findings of the inqu inquiry into the 2008 fire uh, would have been published by now. Um, and I would have been able to say more than I now can, but uh, unfortunately the, the official inquiry hasn't yet been published, uh, and so I am slightly limited to, to talking only about things that are in the public domain. So for those of you who don't know, the, the Channel Tunnel uh, is the, the fixed rail link between the, the south of uh, England and the north of France. Uh, it crosses uh, more or less the, the shortest uh, sea crossing uh, between the UK and the mainland and the continental Europe uh, and it's approximately 37 kilometres uh, underwater uh, and a few extra kilometres on either end uh, under land. For goods trains uh, or for goods vehicles uh, there are many uh, trains per day uh, and these uh, the goods vehicles just do a loop and uh, so the HGV drive on at one end in France and then they uh, get transported and they drive off uh, at the other end of the train returns uh, with a, a load of HGV going the other direction. There are also passenger trains uh, that pass through the, the tunnel, the Eurostar come from London going to Paris or uh, Lille or wherever, um, Belgium as well I believe. Uh, and there are also uh, trains that transport cars but our focus is going to be on the, the trains that carry a heavy goods vehicles because it is only in those three, uh, those three incidents have all involved uh, trains uh, that carry heavy goods vehicles. I stole this quite nice picture from the Guardian newspaper in the UK, um, so some of the terminology is slightly dumbed down, but uh, essentially this gives you an overview of, of the, the shape and layout of the, the tunnels. There are two tunnels, each containing a single uh, track for the, the trains, one generally heading one direction UK to France, the other heading from France to the UK. Uh, and in between those two for most of the, the length, uh, there is a service tunnel uh, where for fire brigade, fire brigade access, for general maintenance services, uh, and also in the event of an incident, the passengers will be evacuated into the, the service tunnel. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, this needs to be at, at higher pressure than the, the other tunnels so that no smoke uh, from the incident tunnel will flow into the, uh, the service tunnel. Uh, the access doors are every 375 metres um, from the, the main tunnels into the access tunnel, the service tunnel rather. So the, there are three, have been three incidents um, and I'll just give you a very simple uh, sort of overview uh, of, of what happened before getting into the details. Uh, the first uh, was a few years after, two and a half years after the, the tunnel opened uh, in November 1996. Uh, the train in this instance was coming from France. Um, I'm going to show pictures of all three trains heading the same direction uh, for ease of comparison. Uh, although this one was coming from France, the other two are coming from the UK, but I'll, I'll point them all as if they're heading from right to left. Uh, the layout of the train uh, is obviously at the front of the train there is a locomotive, which I've uh, indicated in green here. Um, then there's a an amenity coach which have uh, coloured in this sort of pinky purple colour there, um, where the, the drivers of all the heavy goods vehicles uh, are. So during the transit through the tunnel, the drivers are not with their vehicles, uh, they are all, uh, 
I've lost my cursor, there they are. They are all in the, the amenity coach. Then there's a loader wagon, which is basically uh, a piece of empty space. And then there are two rakes uh, of, of 15 wagons, each containing uh, one heavy goods vehicle or possibly two uh, smaller vans. Uh, in the middle of the train, there's another loader wagon. At the rear of the train, a final loader wagon and an empty locomotive. There are no staff uh, on the, the locomotive at the back. So in the incident in 1996, the, uh, the fire broke out somewhere in the second rake. Uh, I've indicated in, in orange approximately where it was. Um, in the incident uh, in 2006, although the, the train was going from the UK uh, towards France, uh, the, the fire in that incident was in the, the second last uh, carriage. And in the most recent fire, um, I, I can't be absolutely sure that it was on the second occupied carriage. There were actually three empty carriages at the front of the train because it wasn't a full capacity train. So some of the carriages were empty, as indicated by the, the darker uh, carriages. The fire was somewhere near the start of the train. So um, of the three incidents, that was the fire that was closest to where the passengers were. Uh, this much is in the public domain. I can't really say much more about where the fire actually started. So looking at the, the smallest fire first, um, the fire consumed one of the, the HGV uh, and it didn't spread. It didn't spread either to the, the vehicle upstream or the vehicle downstream. Um, this was the sum total of damage to the vehicle which we'll normally call upstream of the incident as in towards the front of the train. Um, as you can see, there's some melting of the, the, the bumper area at the back of the train, but there was no fire spread, uh, and that vehicle was able to drive away uh, with no problems. Similarly, the vehicle on the other side, uh, there was some melting of plastic components on the, the ref it was a refrigerated trailer, uh, and there was some uh, melting of the, the refrigeration unit, uh, but the fire didn't uh, take hold. Which is amazing when you look at the, the mess in the middle. The, the fire in the middle was completely uh, consumed. The vehicle in the middle was completely consumed. Uh, in 1996, it was a very different scenario. Uh, the, the vehicles I've coloured in orange there were all affected by the fire, either fully burned out, as in the ones that are fully orange, or the ones that are, are sort of uh, fading to orange uh, were severely heat damaged. Um, this is a I can't, don't know which one of these vehicles it was, but it's a, a typical picture of, of what the, uh, the, the remains after that fire looked like. And in addition to damage to the rolling stock, damage to the cargo, uh, there was also 480 metres of damage to the tunnel, which actually extended well off the screen uh, in the picture I have here. And much the same happened again uh, in September 11th, 2008, although this, in this case, because the fire was near the front of the train, uh, the fire extended pretty much the whole length of the train involving, as far as I am aware, all the HGV vehicles that were being carried there. Um, and uh, as far as I know, the locomotive and the loader wagons uh, were both damaged beyond repair, or were all damaged beyond repair. In addition to that, there was 650 metres worth of damage to the tunnel. And there are, are some photos uh, of the, the incident uh, in 2008. So we have a small incident in 2006, relatively small, a larger one in 1996, and a very large one in 2008. And the question I would like to address for the rest of the, the presentation is what on earth was different in 2006? Why was it such a small incident in relative terms compared to the other two? 